Okay, everyone, and good afternoon or howdy, as we say in Texas. <laughs> Welcome to the Race Talks Interdisciplinary Virtual Colloquium Series at Texas A&M University. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I am Dr. Mariana Gariazzo, and today is our last event, our discussion on anti-racist pedagogy. Um, last event for this semester for Race Talks. We have a panel of extraordinary speakers joining us today, and my colleague Dr. Lafivers will be moderating the panel. Race Talks aims to lay a conceptual foundation for curricular change while extending its service to the College of Liberal Arts and the University at large. This semester, we had scheduled a total of 24 events linked to the series, 10 public talks like the one today, and 14 class visits. This is our last event, so I would like to acknowledge the initiatives, the programs, and the people that contributed to bringing together this ambitious programming. So many thanks to the College of Liberal Arts for funding this series through the Advanced Climate Together Grant. It has been a privilege to work collaboratively with faculty in all participating units, African Studies, the Dance Program, Film Studies, Latino and Mexican American Studies, Performance Studies, and Religious Studies. Co-BIs on this project include Dr. Christine Bergeron, Professor Reina Dexter, Dr. Donnelly Docks, Dr. Daniel Humphrey, Dr. Alain Laco Sukam, Dr. Andy Spalling, Dr. Nancy Planky Videla, and thank you to all of you for your vision and for joining on these important conversations. The support of faculty in performance studies has been loud and clear throughout the semester. We are indebted to Dean Steve Oberhelman, all our colleagues in performance studies. And I would like to acknowledge those of you who volunteer to moderate or facilitate events in order of appearance. Dr. Marty Regan, Dr. Donnelly Docks, Dr. Nancy Videla, Professor Andrea Inhoff, Professor Reina Dexter, and Dr. Ka Corey Lafivers. This series would not have been possible without the enormous assistance of our amazing staff in performance studies. So thank you so much for, uh, for your assistance uh, throughout the semester, Myra Rangel, Darlene Flores, and Kathy Payne. To all joining us um, at this event, I invite you to truly demonstrate the Aggie spirit that sets this community apart. Our core values of excellence, integrity, leadership, and respect inform all of our Race Talks events, and everyone in the call is expected to adhere to those core values. Um, another uh, reminder that I would like to mention today is that we typically stay on mute, and so I will ask all the participants it, who are watching to stay on mute to facilitate the best sound for our um, conversations and uh, to um, I would like to also encourage you to post your questions throughout the event on the chat and we'll be looking and facilitating those questions back to the panelists. At the end of the event there will be a very short survey that I will post. This is as anony anonymous and voluntary survey and everyone is welcome to complete that survey. And so without further ado I would like to welcome our wonderful panelists and Dr. Lafever please take it away. Thank you so much and uh, thank you everyone for being here. I'm very excited for our um, last panel of this of the semester. Um, and for today, we are going to be offering a critical discussion that's going to focus on anti-racist pedagogy in performing visual arts and the humanities. And our amazing panelists will be providing thoughts and recommendations on how curricular changes can ignite processes or progress toward a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive culture. I'd like to begin by um, introducing all of our panelists, and we'll begin with Narda E. Alcorn, who is a professor and stage manager who has worked on Broadway, off-Broadway, regionally and internationally. In 2019, Narda was appointed chair of the stage management program at Yale School of Drama. She has been head of stage management for New York University, DePaul University, and State University of New York at Purchase. 
She received DePaul's Excellence in Teaching Award in 2015 and the Robert Kristen Award for Excellence in Technical Collaboration in 2017. With co-author Lisa Porter, Narda has written Stage Management Theory as a Guide to Practice, Cultivating a Creative Approach and the HowlRound article, We Commit to Anti-Racist Stage Management Education. Thank you and welcome, Narda. We also have joining us Alan De Souza, whose artworks restage colonial era legacies through counter strategies of humor, fiction, and mistranslation. Recent projects Through the Black Country from 2017 and La Vida del Capitan from 2019 transpose Henry Stanley's 1870s ex African expedition journals to England during the 2016 Brexit vote and Columbus's 1492 ship diaries to a 2019 expedition from Oakland to Seville. Both projects include expedition maps and photo uh, photographs. De Souza's work has been shown extensively in the US and internationally. His book, How Art Can Be Thought, a Handbook for Change, published by Duke in 2018, closely examines art pedagogy and critique and provides an extensive analytical glossary of common art terms while considering how they may be adapted to new artistic and social challenges. De Souza is represented by Talwar Gallery in New York and New Delhi and is professor and chair of the Department of Art Practice at the University of California, Berkeley. Welcome, Alan. Thank you, welcome. Next, we have Amy Carrillo Rowe, a professor and chair of communication studies at California State University, Northridge. She works across writing genres as a memoirist, feminist theorist, and culture critic. Her research focuses on human and inhuman processes of performances and performances of becoming as relational, embodied, and fluid across contexts, including US popular culture, Indian workplaces, US Latinx performing arts communities. Her books include Power Lines on the Subject of Feminist Alliances from Duke in 2008, Answer the Call, Virtual Migration in Indian Call Centers from the University of Minnesota Press in 2013, and Silence, Feminism, Power, Reflections at the Edges of Sound from Paul Grave in 2013. Carrillo Rowe is currently working on a book entitled Queer Chicana, Performing the Sacred, which examines the vexed politics of healing, logging, longing, and indigenous erasure in queer Chicana Chicana performance, and a memoir about queer single motherhood entitled Afterbirth, Memoir of a Queer Family. Welcome very much, Amy. Thank you for coming. And finally, we have joining us uh, Samantha in Shepherd, who is the Mary Armstrong Maduski. 1980 Assistant Professor of Cinema and Media Studies in the Department of Performing and Media Arts at Cornell University. She is the author of Sporting Blackness, Race, Embodiment, and Critical Muscle Memory on Screen from the University of California Press in 2020. She is co-editor of the anthologies from Medea to Media Mogul, Theorizing Tyler Perry from the University of Mississippi Press in 2016 with Treandria Russworm and Karen Baudry and Sporting Realities, Critical Readings on the Sports Documentary from University of Nebraska Press in 2020 with Travis Vogan. She has published in Film Quarterly, The Velvet Light Trap, Cinema Journal, Journal of Sport History, Journal of Sport and Social Issues, and Black Camera, an international journal and the anthologies LA Rebellion, Creating a New Black Cinema from University of California Press 2015, and Race and the Revolutionary Impulse in The Spook Who Sat by the Door, Indiana University Press 2018. So again, thank you. Welcome, Samantha. Uh, one, one more time, thank you all for coming and thank you to our panelist, panelists. And um, I think we'd like to start off by kind of just jumping right into anti-racist pedagogy. Um, and so to begin, um, in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, 
Author Ibram X. Kendi identifies an anti-racist as one who is supporting an anti-racist policy through their actions or expressing an anti-racist idea. And sort of with that introduction or definition or framing in mind, um, we're very curious to know what does anti-racist pedagogy look or feel like to you? And in other words, can you maybe share an example of a strategy, a technique, or perhaps even a structural shift that you have incorporated and reflect a little bit on the results of that? And again, we're going to operate with sort of throwing a question out and seeing who wants to jump on that first, and we'll go from there. I'll just go ahead and get us started just to um, open a space. And um, it's wonderful to be here with you. I love being in anti-racist spaces um, because it feels safe and it feels, um, I feel embraced and seen. Um, so part of the feeling, um, I'm, I'm very much into feeling, um, is um, of anti-racist pedagogy um, can be scary. Um, it can be a scary feeling um, to have your body be the one in front of the room and be on the line, um, creating space and holding space. And um, it can be scary because um, whiteness as a performance, as an everyday performance of um, identity and culture is, um, and this is one of my arguments in Power Lines, is um, race evasive. The performance of whiteness is the performance of evading the discussion of race. It's the silence around race. And so as soon as you um, name race in the classroom, um, you've introduced um, what Du Bois calls the problem of race. You know, what does it feel like to be a problem? Um, so you introduce that and it's as if race wasn't in the room before you named it. And that to, to carry that burden, um, especially in a racialized body, is a tremendous, um, a, is a tremendous burden. Um, to, to place on a, a faculty member, but also um, our students. Um, and I say this um, as somebody who taught for 10 years at the University of Iowa in a primarily white classroom. And now I teach at California State University, Northridge. Hallelujah. I mean, it's just like, I love it when we have like, in my classes of like 30 students or, or 25 students, I'll usually have like two or three or four um, white students and they're pretty down you know like so it's it to, to me teaching it, it's also where we're doing anti-racist pedagogy um and and what kind of community and i know this this goes um to the question of of curriculum and also the question of hiring um i've been at csun for 10 years now and been part of hiring oh my God, we have the most fabulous diverse faculty. And so our students are just like immersed from the minute that they get there. So it, it, in, um, in the, it, I guess it's at every level, like to the extent that one can be part of a, a, of a curriculum and, a, and of a anti-racist um, pedagogy community, um, the, 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 it, it's not scary. It feels like being here, you know, like we're, 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 we're in this, we're in a brown commons, you know, uh, we're in an under commons, we're, we're here together um, to, um, to name and, and, and support one another. Um, but I've ha I have had other institutional moments where um, it, it's, it's quite scary. I wanted to, um leap off of what uh, Amy said, if I may. Uh, and first of all, it's fantastic to be here. Thank you for uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me. Specifically in regards to naming race, I um, I hear I, I hear the uh, the burden uh, certainly on faculty and on students. And I would counter, um, and certainly it has become the practice at the Yale School of Drama. Naming race has been liberating. Because what it what it means is that when I walk into a space, um, I am seen. Uh, my entire identity is seen, 
and there is no sense that uh, that in many ways the most visible part of me has to go unspoken because we can name uh, you know blackness and whiteness. Um, and all of, you know, throughout the entire BIPOC uh, community, folks can be seen uh, as, as this is part of, but part of how you're showing up uh, in the classroom. And so I would, I would say that I think naming race, although yes, it does, it very much introduces the problem because, uh, and, and I think honestly, we all should be, um, it is now time to talk about the problem <laughs> of race. Uh, and what it does is it does, um, it, it offers an opportunity in much the same way that we, I think now, um, no longer have to be silent about gender. We can, we can walk into a space um, and all genders uh, can be discussed and named. Sexual orientation can be discussed and named. Um, and so now race can be discussed and named. And um, I think that that's quite powerful and I think it can be quite liberating because I think that specifically, of course, for faculty, but students can feel like they don't have to leave themselves at the door. And certainly within, in my scope of, of specifically working in uh, the American theater um, and what has been, uh, what we have touted as professionalism, which I think has been um, sort of, a, you know, an oppressive and a supremacist way of viewing how we show up to do the work. Uh, I think it has been unspoken that um, authenticity in regards to race, it was not welcome. And so, um, so I, I, I would say that naming race is, is a step towards, um, towards that and naming the, the, the power that race still holds, I think, um, not only in the classroom, um, but, but other places. Um, one of the practices, in, in, in addition to naming race, I believe, um, part of a uh, pedagogy can include um, discussing what the, the dynamic is. Um, I certainly, I, I, am, I have a class where, uh, it's just one, but I have a class where um, all of the students are either uh, white or hold light skin privilege. Uh, and I am their black professor and there is a dynamic in that. So there is the positional power that I hold uh, and then there is the racial or skin privilege that is prevalent uh, within the students. Um, and by discussing that, it, um, it helps to, in many ways, dim diminish some of that power. And it also opens the door so that when those dynamics come up, we can actually talk about them. Um, so I would say that uh, talking about um, power dynamics to me goes hand in hand with anti-racist uh, practice um, in regards to specifically in the classroom um, as, as things that we can do. Thank you so much for that. That was wonderful. I want to add as well, um, and I want to say thank you all for holding this space and for the invitation to be a part of the conversation. For myself, I think I, I want to answer this kind of temporally. So like anti-racist pedagogy now looks and feels different than when I would say I was practicing it before the term became the term, right? Before it became so... Um, a hyper signifier of the institution's awareness of their of their lacks. Um, so doing anti-racist pedagogy now makes the work feel <laughs> both important, but also um, just just different in this moment. So, for example, I teach African American cinema, um, a, a class on African American cinema, which had historically maybe had seven students. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I'm always pointing out this class should be populated. We have a, an American film history class that has 100 students. And when I've come to pitch to that class and I say, you all should be taking African-American cinema, um, and I'm like, because it's American film history. You shouldn't have to wait two years for the American film history class. I teach American film history. They like, it's just what it is. Um, and I've always played with the idea, like, what if I just call it American film history, then they get the syllabus and they're like, <laughs> one of these is all like the others. Um, and I was just like, ah, that's a real quick way to do a quick shock test. But, but I think it's really important to name what it is as part of the social and cultural history of that class. Um, but this time I had 48 students, 40 of which were black identified and four of the, the, the remaining eight were, um, were, were people of color. 
I say that because part of anti-racist pedagogy or thinking about teaching is teaching, teaching these courses often because sometimes the course will have to meet the moment. So it's like these students were looking to be in a class after this summer that spoke to them, that had a black teacher. Um, and like I said, it was then somebody said to me, oh, Professor Shepard, it felt like I went to an HBCU. I got a little Howard experience. I had a little Spelman moment. Um, and I was like, ah, me too. It almost felt like I worked at an HBCU because I went into a classroom and I saw students who looked like me. I didn't have to sit there and explain the importance of this. We came with a baseline. So I really do think it's important to continue to teach courses um, that are doing the work, that have been doing the work in the past, even if they have not filled up, but also thinking temporally about what pedagogy looks and feels like, it has made thinking about equality and equity and being attentive to anti-Blackness, um, anti-Asian violence, um, anti-trans violence has meant that I have had to think about teaching so more softly. And by that, I mean canceling class like, I think one of the biggest things I performed for my students, which is that we do not need this now. You all need to go off and be good to yourselves. And so I have canceled more class and I'm like, and I like class because I have something to do. Like, I just, I love it. But it's also learning to teach softly means reminding them that we also should not continue on. This is not like the institution is invested in one thing. That's why we'll get a Hallmark email after a verdict that says students, here is a Zoom you can go to to make you feel better. Nothing for the faculty, of course, but um, we can get all of that stuff. But sometimes it's more of the radical, like we don't need to do this. Go, go seek the comforts that exist. Um, so I've stopped class. Um, I have thought about being a softer person and I'm always about, basically in terms of teaching, and this will get to curricular changes, but um, making sure the work exists in all the classes that exist, um, especially the ones that are considered to be um, required. Um, as often work that are about um, ethnic minorities, um, racial minorities, um, queer people are electives. So I, it's really, really important for the elective work to, to become required. Um, so. I think that's enough for, for right now from me. Um, well, thank, thank you so much. I mean, there's, my head's already buzzing with <laughs> um, so many thoughts from all of you. Um, yeah, I, you know, this, this sort of name, naming the problem um, uh, uh, or introducing um, uh, or identifying the problem as race. Um, and, I guess I approach it as identifying identifying the problem as whiteness. So that that as as that being the racial racial problem in the room, um, and how to bring that into teaching. Um, and and one of the examples uh, when I first came to uh, Berkeley, you know where I am now, um, the the department had just started a, a global perspectives course. Um, and I think I might have been one of the first people to teach it. Um, I remember the sort of anger in the room from students saying, why, why are we having to do this? You know, um, and especially it was a senior, you know, capstone class, and why are we being, being taught it only now? So first of all, resentment of, well, you know, why do we have to learn about the rest of the world? Um, you know, and I think an undertone of, undertone of that is like, we're America. Um, and then, and I goes also like, why are you telling us that there's a whole world out there when we haven't been told that right from freshmen, being freshmen? Um, and so one of my responses in my teaching is to carry on teaching what the students expect to learn in terms of the sort of the artistic canon, um, but to teach it critically and, and to identify it as the problem um, of how it actually contributes to, uh, you know, Nada, you mentioned um, supremacy, um, how it actually builds up 
you know, the, the sort of building blocks of um, supremacy, white supremacy as a kind of aesthetic language, um, which is anti-black. Um, uh, it, you know, it's very language and it's aesthetics and so on. And so, um, but, but also one of, one of the things that has shifted a little bit for me is, as you mentioned, how it's now easier to talk about those things because more faculty are doing that. Um, whereas if, if you were one of the, only, perhaps the only one or maybe one or two faculty who are doing it, um, it was easy for students to isolate your teaching um, as a kind of anomaly because they're being counter supported in every other class they're taking. And so that, that's what seems to have shifted more recently. I wonder if, I, mean, I might jump around on our little questions here. Um, and I think because there was information I think mentioned at the beginning with Amy and certainly at the end with, Alan's comments, I wonder if we shouldn't get to the issue of whiteness. And um, let's go with this question here. So in his book, Black Bodies, White Gazes, The Continuing Significance of Race in America, George Yancey speaks of the need to unsuture whiteness or to crack it open. Um, and he explains being, un quote, I'm quoting here, being unsutured is a site of openness, loss, and great discomfort. It is a site of suffering, a form of suffering that is necessary for white people. And while we're thinking about what anti-racist pedagogy looks or feels like and strategies, I wonder what strategies you've uncovered or discovered that are helpful for bringing white folks to a place of discomfort that is required for anti-racist work without generating defensive reactions that seem to shut down that work. Um, so I'd love to see if, you know, what you all have thoughts on, on that and experiences with that. Uh, maybe I can just mention, you know, that if we're not doing anti-racist anti teaching, then, you know, are we doing racist teaching? Um, and, you know, just the mention of suturing um, you know, it's dependent on the notion of, of, on wounding, you know, that um, a, a suture is, is a kind of healing of a wound, um, but what does it mean to open up the sutures before the wound is healed? Or perhaps the wound is festering, um, uh, but it's also, you know, the inflicting of wounds. And if that's what racist teaching is doing, um, you know, that the unsuturing is also to um, work against, you know, that, that continuing uh, of, of wounding. I think that's so beautifully said, Alan, um, because um, the Mab Segrist in her books, in her book, Born to Belonging, talks about um, whiteness there is there is a woundedness of whiteness she calls it like she talks about the ways in which we over we come over we overcome that woundedness through an anesthetic ascetic like constantly anesthetizing ourselves from whiteness um from the wounds of whiteness that evolved you know that that devolves and stands on the shoulders of um chattel slavery of ongoing violence toward black and brown bodies on indigenous dis dispossession. Um, and that's a, that's a terrible wound that white people in a white nation, um, white settler nation ha has to carry. And so I think part of the work of the anti-racist pedagogy with regard to that beautiful term of, uns of unsuturing is um, normalizing the discomfort that is anti-racist work and um, telling, telling students like, yes, I think it's um, almost Corey, it's not about like um, not 
like managing the discomfort. I think the discomfort, like it, maybe it's more of like the discomfort is just a necessary part of the unsuturing. Like we're going to be just like undone by each other, you know? And um, one of the ways that I um, have brought this into the classroom is through a performance. And this would be in my performance and cultural studies methods class is a performance that um, the class culminates in, which is called the coalitional performance. And um, the students will find each other in a partnership. And then I ask them to work together and, and this sort of builds on their um, autoethnographic work where they do um, what Shuri Moraga describes as a heartfelt grappling with our privileges and our oppressions. It's like, it's not just like, oh, well, you know, white privileges, you know, I don't even know, you know, like I really pushed my white students um, and my students of color who also are engaged in a world of whiteness as well, you know, to examine our relationship to, to whiteness in, in, and to other structures of privilege, um, gender um, performance, gender um, being cisgender, being hetero, being a certain class position. Um, and then they, and then the second, so the first step is that heartfelt grappling, which is an, a step that one examines in oneself. And then the second step is um, bridge work, um, which is the work of sharing that deep heartfelt grappling with this performance partner. And then they are asked to create a, a, a 10 minute performance for the, by the end of the semester and write a script and we workshop it and everything. Um, but it can be right where so much can be conveyed with the body and with silence and with props and with images um, that, that, that um, and then this, you know, the, there's an arts, you all are the artists here, you know, I, I, I'm an imposter among you, but uh, so you might know much more about this than I do, but um, it seems to me that um, the arts and the performing body um, are ways that we can delve into the into the suture um, and the unsuturing in in ways that can can be um, beautifully expressed in, in a healing way because I think the unsuturing is really healing the 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 wound that Alan is 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 gesturing toward is is a deep wound of whiteness that it's like you you can't not know how awful <laughs> We we are and, and what and what we inherit as as um, as our our genealogy as our ancestors as 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 white people, and I say this as the mixed race Chicana who um, very much um, seek to hold myself accountable for my settler and my white identities. I think that is pretty amazing. <laughs> Uh, what you said, and I, I also want to offer a, a, a parallel thought because um, I really love, I mean, I really, really love Yanti's work, period, but I love this idea in theory and in practice, and but I want to highlight the, the, the dangers of that practice, depending on who's doing that and where they're doing that. Um, to unsuture whiteness and to make whiteness discomforted as a black woman in a classroom is a deliberate choice and a deliberate time with a deliberate group of students who have been white in that space long enough that I think, oh, these are the right white ones, right? It's, it's not, you can't, it's different than when I'm talking to my friend who works at SUNY Staten Island. She's like, that's a very particular kind of working class white people that's a, it's a different kind of conversation. Um, you don't know who's gonna get aggressive with you. I mean, physically aggressive in your face, that kind of thing. So I think there is a way in which we wanna think about um, discomfort, which is super, super important. And the ways in which doing this pedagogically can be risk-taking and can be very vulnerable um, for those who are doing it and still necessary work. And one of the ways I have thought about the process of doing that is first having to spend some time with the students and learning who the students are, creating a level of comfortability, which is um, its work itself but then picking very particular work. That's why I really loved Amy's, um, um, your final project, picking very particular work to do particular work. So in film, if I wanna teach them about whiteness, it's very, 
it's obvious if I say, oh, we're going to screen a clip of Birth of a Nation. Oh, this is so racist, but I'm not attached to this, even though, you know, the building blocks of cinema were, were you know, were, were scraped together with this. I'll show them Miracle. I'll show them the hockey movie Miracle <laughs> so they can see how whiteness is tied to nationalism. And then I'll pair it with Dyer's white. And then I will mostly fade to the black. And I do mean like, I will just sit back and let the students, and this is the privilege of the kinds of students who are in the class, but do the work of auto-correcting each other and then being like, ah, oh, I see it here and I see it everywhere. Um, and so that kind of thing is when I point out, oh, here is a very white, white, white thing. Um, now, do you see all the other white, white things? And then they actually get comfortable about pointing out the ways in which they have it actually is not their discomfort. The way they have been eased into everything, greased up, made smooth through the world. And hopefully that itself is a discomfort. Um, but, but I just wanted to put out there that, that that work is very difficult because defensive reactions are a very real thing. I've had students be like, you've got an agenda, you've, you know, and really attackful. And I'm like, yeah, it's called the syllabus. Like, what, what, what did you think we were doing here? We're just coming here, just jit chattering? Like, it's, you know, it's the, the whole function of a course. Um, but, but that agenda for him was, was one that said, I was going to talk about racial and gender. And, and he just thought he was going to have a good time. And I was like, let's not go have a good time one-on-one. If I was going to have that party, I wouldn't have it at 10. Um, so I just, I think that there's, there's something I want to add to that. Sorry, T tend to joke. <laughs> Manta, thank you. I so appreciate uh, you naming that, that that the discomfort can absolutely be dangerous to some of us. Um, life life dangering uh, to some of us. I think that that's really important. And and um, Corey, I would say I think that this was just uh, the 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 wording used, but I very much. Um, it, it's certainly not on on our BIPOC faculty. Uh, in my opinion, to be responsible for the comfort or discomfort of any of my other white white colleagues. So that's, uh, I just want to be clear, clear that we are, uh, we are not responsible. And in fact, I actually believe um, it is my my white colleagues who who actually have this work to do, um, specifically in regards to, of course, um, being comfortable with uh, being uncomfortable and examining their own whiteness, uh, and of course what that means, uh, given their uh, the space that you know that that is taken up um, in the classroom in America as we do this work. I so want to. Um, I just want to amplify, Alan, what you said. That so critical question. If we're not um, if we're not anti-racist teachers, what kind of teachers are we? I think I think we are racist teachers if we are not intentionally anti-racist. And I so appreciate that question. Um, I, you know, uh, practically speaking, I, uh, I'm a chair of a department and um, I have a small faculty and they are all white. And, um, and I am new to this position. I've been uh, at, at Yale, this is my second year. And it has been extremely challenging um, because uh, as a chair, I am absolutely responsible for, um, uh, for uplifting uh, my faculty and I want them to show up in the classrooms. I believe it was, um, I don't remember exactly, but uh, in, in, in regards to this work needs to be in all of the classes, it needs to be everywhere. And so uh, not just in my classroom, am I gonna deliver anti-racist pedagogy, but I need for my faculty to be on board. Um, and I need for my white faculty to, uh, you know, to, to, to make a conscious commitment to anti-racism. I have found, um, I have found the uh, the discomfort and the the fragility to be great, and I will say that when we you know from where we started uh, in September to where we are now uh, has been significant. Um, and what's wonderful now that is that is finally happening is before it was always uh, I was the one to. You know, at, you know, after the mid mid semester check in to, uh, you know, to comment on, you know, all of the sources are still white men, and we talked about this, <laughs> so let's see what we can do here, or 
or I was the one to um, uh, to talk about language. Language is huge in terms of um, uh, really promoting uh, anti-racist spaces um, and, and what we call things and how we refer to things. Um, and now what's slowly happening is that my white faculty is actually uh, correcting and suggesting uh, uh, to each other, which is, which is the goal. <laughs> um, but it, it's taken that long. It's taken that long just in terms of, again, self-education and commitment um, and being incredibly uncomfortable. And I will say too, for myself, what I have found to be um, so important, uh, and this speaks to what Samantha was saying, I have students um, uh, specifically now because I think that there is the feeling um, in my lovely little small world of the theater where uh, folks who are white are feeling displaced. They're feeling like, they are going to, uh, you know, they've been doing this forever, but, you know, somebody who's BIPOC is going to just get the job simply because they're BIPOC. The narrative is horrible in, in how we talk about um, hiring in this country because we have never named whiteness as a factor and whiteness has always been a factor. Um, and yet we always name uh, other ethnicities as a factor. And that, again, it just, it's, um, it's such a charged issue. And, um, and I have uh, amongst some of my white students, a lot of anti-blackness um, uh, and a lot of uh, students who are openly hostile, um, you know, in the classroom. And I have needed to use my white allies and my white faculty to honestly, to talk to those students because those students are not gonna listen to me. And that's okay. The, the, the point is to, to get through to the student. So it's again, always wanting to center the student. Um, and that's been invaluable to have white colleagues step up and say, you know what, I, I will actually do that. I, you know, let me do that for you. Um, and again, because uh, speaking again to um, how Samantha beautifully framed it, uh, the work of anti-racism is ongoing. It is, it is a value. It should be integrated into everything. And for some of us, this is our personal liberation. This is, this is not, this is not just something that we can put aside. So to have um, to have a colleague who is willing to to intervene, especially a white colleague, um, can be quite uh, quite meaningful. Thank you all for your responses uh, to that question. And uh, you know, we were we had a question we were going to pose, and we were going back and forth about whether we should ask it. And I think the conversation has gone that way. And Mariana might ask me later, like, why did you do that? But I think we've kind of reached this point. So I want to go ahead and, and ask a couple of three questions about the same idea. And we'll start with a rather blunt one. Okay. As people of color, is it your job to fix our racism? I'm just going to throw that out there rather bluntly. Uh, and then with that rather blunt idea in mind, could you possibly elaborate for us on the role of allyship and what you see as the role of whites in anti-racist pedagogy? And then the third component of that is actually an audience question we already got. Um, as a white instructor in a class that is white, how can I approach anti-racism in a way that acknowledges my and our race and privilege? So it was kind of a lot, but they're all related. And I wanted to give you all these different angles to sort of address this. The blunt, is it your job to fix us? Um, two, uh, what do you see as the role of allyship? And then three, how can a white instructor in a class that is white approach anti-racism in a way that acknowledges our race and privilege? So Samantha, you wanna go if I can maybe also problem problematize the question, um, maybe it's to decenter who the us is speaking uh, right from the get go of like who's actually asking that question. Um, uh, you know, uh, so the notion of um, an ask an us asking uh, a you <laughs> for a solution. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, and, and the, other, the other part of that question, um, and again, this is, um, you know, it, it comes up all the time, but it's also about, you know, what, what are the conversations between uh, BIPOC people, um, uh, you know, that which uh, that can take place without centralizing whiteness as well, you know, um, uh, you know, people with, um, 
very different histories, uh, you know, whether indigenous or, um, or enslavement or migration, you know, how do those conversations um, actually enter into uh, anti-racist work within the institution, you know, um, without even whiteness actually being part of that conversation, you know, because there's other histories to addre address as well. I agree with that. I mean, I want to add that I think the answer to the to the, both the complicated question or or to the to the to the question you've complicated, but if you simplified, um, my first reaction was no. <laughs> but then my other reaction was like, if you've gone to the well, you drank of the water, and then you come back still thirsty, then we can sit down and we can have a meal. Like we can have a conversation if that's, if not, cause I'm here to teach you something. What I have found the baseline and I, you know, shout out to Kendi who has turned a book into a dollar and a dollar into a business. Um, but like people are asking that question so disingenuously, like they need a one-on-one -on -one tutor which is the privilege itself. That's why the first reaction is no. You had the question already enunciated a privilege. Like there wasn't books, like there aren't libraries, like there aren't histories. Like you didn't take any time to even Google your question to answer it before you came to me to ask that question. Not you actually, Corey, of course. Not. But I mean, in the sense of like, that's what actually is what bothers me about should you teach us that. It's like, when did you, did you do this independent study? <laughs> Did you like, you know, that kind of thing? I think the labor of it being on black, like, and this is, this is even the, and the I hate to do the self-criticalness of the moment that I'm in, but it's the invitation of this now. Like what I'm hearing is that Alan, Amy and Narda and myself are exceptional people. We should have been in these spaces already in, in other contexts, sharing about our work when you would have gotten the tomes and the tone of what we're even talking about in the context of what we're experts on. And so I think about that kind of critical sort of thing that, that, doesn't, that doesn't happen when people don't do the work, which is my first problem with that question. And then the second part of, of, of thinking about this is that I really, I really, I think, I think you know. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna hold my second part. I'm gonna let other people jump in. I'm gonna hold it to the. I'll hold it for a second. Samantha, that was just so beautifully said, um, and and it just reminds me of being in that situation where you feel like that a white person is encountering maybe some kind of incipient consciousness, which perhaps an early stage of that is just a feeling of horrible shame and guilt you know, that suturing, you know, the, the feeling of becoming unsutured. And, you know, I definitely feel so much compassion for that. Um, and as a person who was raised to um, interpolate into whiteness and to perform whiteness um, as, a, as a mode of survival, as a Mexicana, those, our own lands have been taken from us, you know, in Cal here in California. Um, I identify very much with that, um, with that pain of that unsuturing. And, and um, at the same time, the question presumes a kind of like redemption, almost like that people of color can offer to white people. That is an impossible ask, you know, like it's not really about that particular like black or brown person um, or red person or Asian person affirming that you're a good white person, you know, like it has to go sort of beyond that need to um, have some kind of speech act, you know, liberate or, you know, confirm the goodness of, of, of the white person. Um, but, but that said, you know, for, for a white instructor um, in a classroom who, who's all white, um, I think acknowledging that race privilege in that moment and setting up the class in such a way that it um, that the readings are sort of um, in the way that Samantha described with how she is, you know, showing the film and the, the reading is paired with it. And like, so the course um, can be designed in such a way that it's just constantly 
inviting us intellectually to unmask whiteness. And um, then in, in the classroom, um, you can perform what that looks like. Um, and it looks like making yourself vulnerable. I mean, just to recall the, um, the unsuturing quote by, by Yancy that um, Corey shared a little bit ago, um, excuse me. Um, I think to the extent that, that one can model that in the classroom, um, our own vulnerability um, in whatever space that we're in, you know, um, and all, all the while knowing that vulnerability is unevenly born on differently racialized bodies. Um, so I think I'll just stop there. <laughs> Thank you. But thanks for the great question and the, and the, the inspiring weaving of answers. I wanted to um, just briefly, uh, I so appreciate Alan's call to decenter whiteness in the question. I think, um, yes, and I, I, and I would even go so far as to say um, for myself in my anti-racist work uh, and in the classroom, uh, decentering whiteness, um, from some of the from some of the the anti-racist work, meaning that, um, you know, many of us, of course, are familiar with, um, uh, you know, Kenneth Jones and Tima Okun, their lovely research um, on the white supremacy characteristics, um, and the focus, especially as I teach, I teach managers uh, in the theater, and so management supervisors they they carry a lot of the. Um, you know, the tenets of uh, the sense of urgency and the individualism and the perfectionism and all of these white supremacy tenets, which, um, which show up in every, every hue of body, which show up in, in all folks. And so I think, um, uh, I think it's important as we, as we center anti-racism and de-center whiteness to realize that, especially again, for those of us socialized um, here in the States, our very, our, 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 our interpersonal relationships, how we are in relationship with each other uh, is, um, uh, is problematic and be, can be changed honestly by intentionality and awareness. And so, you know, awareness of perfectionism, awareness of what is the sense of urgency doing to us, awareness of what is this, uh, this binary thinking, you know. So there, there are ways to, I think, um, do the work that, that can help to, again, uh, go beyond the black white uh, binary that we often find ourselves in. And I think that that's um, extremely important. I do, um, you know, it's, it's fascinating to me because, uh, I've often wished that I was in, you know, uh, I've, I've been fortunate enough, I've been in many rooms with, uh, with all black folks or I, all BIPOC folks. Of course, I've never been in a room uh, because if I was there, it wouldn't be only, but uh, with all, all white folks. Um, but in, in BIPOC spaces, in black spaces, uh, race is a part of, of, of life and it is, it is spoken of always and throughout everything. And uh, I, I only know this from my, um, my uh, friends and family who are white, but that is not the case in many white, white spaces. Um, and I think that actually is a way to start um, changing. White, white people don't regularly speak about race unless they're forced to. And um, I think specifically in the academy, uh, we can scale that up. We can actually uh, teach students teach um, our, our fellow colleagues to talk about race regularly. And I think that that would go a long way um, in terms of helping to start promoting uh, affluency um, and to honestly to raise our tolerance of discomfort uh, as we, again, as we try to promote equity in all of our spaces. Thank you again for all of those amazing uh conversations responses um i think now i want to try to maybe build off of something that narda just mentioned um i think from this angle of stage management and pro professionalism perfectionism and so the question is that i think often uh education might tend to treat the arts or even not just education but 
art society largely tends to sort of treat the arts as aesthetic objects that might somehow be divorced from cultural issues. And I'm wondering how you all respond to, you know, like comments like the show has to be ready, right? So does anti-racist education take away from rehearsal time? Uh, I'm going to jump in. Uh, I think, I think, yes. But again, if this is an anti-racist production, we're actually um, we're we're centering the people, and we're actually decentering the production or meeting a particular timeline or even opening the show, um, because the 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 focus is is now having a, a company of individuals who can authentically. Uh, you know, ideally be in, you know, an amazing relationship with each other and tell this wonderful story in an in a, in a area where, uh, where where harm is able to be addressed and they can be their authentic selves. So sometimes that does mean that you have to stop um, and, and talk it out or to, 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 to try a different way and therefore then adjust the timelines. So I wouldn't, I, um, it's again, it's interesting just with how the, the question is framed and we are so we are literally right in the middle of these discussions at the Yale School of Drama um, it's not about taking away um, and that I think it's so important uh, again we, we live in the scarcity model in, in the states and it's um it's uh it's detrimental it's abundance we we are actually bringing more abundance to to the um to the project because we're actually able to stop and have these conversations um and so again, and it means a shifting of priorities because uh, what what becomes you know so 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 specifically, you know, let's say that we get to a point where where the the technical rehearsals uh, we don't have time to finish, and so maybe the 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 last thirty minutes of the play has to be performed with music stands and lights. Maybe and that's okay because we have prioritized something different and and the the relationships that uh, of the people involved um that's how radical it's pretty radical <laughs> that's how radical we're thinking now and i hope that um again right now we're still uh, discussing the the true test will be uh does that hold true because again in the moment um all of those all of those characteristics will come into play you know and um you know the lighting designer who spent their tire three years wanting to do this piece and then wait a minute they're not going to get to finish or the director is not going to get to realize their physical production um that's huge you know because we have to talk about the fact that you know uh this particular actor feels uh you know marginalized or diminished because of what's something that was said yeah maybe we actually do have to stop and talk about that so it's um i think it's it's really about its culture change it's culture change and it's um it's really introducing this is a value um, and it's constant. It's constantly because it's about engaging and then re-engaging because folks, I think what's gonna happen is, um, yes, I'm on board. Right now, everybody's on board. You go to every arts, arts organization, you see their website, everybody is on board with this work right now. And then when we start to do the work, that's I think when we will have to, it's a continuous re-engagement. Um, I just want to add one small thing as a person who does not work um, um, in production, um, but um, one thing that we have learned from the students, or I, the students have reminded our faculty um, necessarily, is that they are not um, these professional institutions, so they should be better than these professional institutions. And I think once they reminded us that and really the people who are doing the, like that this is not there, you don't need to operate like the jobs we're going into because we're not, we're at a liberal arts school. <laughs> we're here, we're here to learn something better than that. What could it be? And I think that kind of shift um, is, is something that as, as Narda points out becomes completely additive. And so maybe they will only experience a kind of, um, a kind of, 
um, anti-racist workshop or performance or critical production at this place in time. What a gift to give them, you know, and it's not in that narrative, but in the real world, it's like, ah, ah, but we were able to imagine otherwise, which is all that we have been actually been trying to do. And perhaps some of us will be able to take this out there and reshape those spaces in this vision, as opposed to the other way around. And I think that has been really lovely to watch as our students have taken up work when we just had a performance of Asian, I'm going to say this wrong, Asian amnesia that was all student run, done, everything. And honestly, the, the, the shit people were putting on here, I was like, what are, where are y'all finding these plays? And then these students come in with work that is timely, that becomes way too timely in a certain way, but mm. also is so fresh, so resonant. And it's all first time actors, like they may not go, it may not be a career career, but it's like, but what they did was they realized this story of, of Asian female performers in Hollywood's history, um, um, the um, Filipino performers, like it just, it was amazing. Um, and so I just thought this can exist here and maybe never can exist elsewhere, but that's really important to what the space can be. I just want to um, share an example of um, the kind of way we might even imagine the the production space um, in you know in in the work that I'm working on with uh, queer Chicana, where I'm studying queer Chicana indigenous performances. Um, you know, working with uh, Sheree Moraga and um, her play um, La Semilla Caminante, the Traveling Seed and working with Adelina Anthony um, around her productions. Um, these are productions that center queer Chicana indigenous um, characters and storylines. And when the actors go into what we call the susto, which is the, the wound of imperialism, the wound of colonization, um, it's, um, it's considered to be a uh, an experience of a flight of part of one's spirit from 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 one's being when we encounter um, when we encounter imperial violence, and when the actors um, ex are embodying experiences of susto and channeling whatever ancestral knowledge and wisdom and embodiment and DNA that that is enabling them to do that, there can be a breaking down you know like it can it can be breaking down and um so they have a, a shaman on the premises who's there to cleanse the people and the community as they work through the susto the collective trauma and um so it might be just a matter of radically re-envisioning what we think of as production time and what we think of as production stories so it's not just the production content and characters but it's um in that all that coming together that the whole um the production temporality you know we think of of um you know the timeline of you know like urgency and and um the the goal is you know merely the product but really i think for shuri and anthony the the work is in the production process is in the process Oh, Corey, just, just going back to your question, um, does education tend to treat the arts as aesthetic objects somehow distinct or removed from cultural issues? Um, I, I think it does. And, and I, you know, I've come across artists themselves who, um, uh, you know, I was on a panel, uh, another panel, um, where uh, another artist on the panel, who was actually a former chair of my department, um, uh, and, oh, I like that I can actually claim it as my department, but anyway, um, a, a former chair said something along the lines of, he finds culture intrudes on his own studio practice. And for me, that was like absolutely nonsensical. Um, uh, but, I, but I think it's a, it's a view that's prevalent that somehow we're making objects which are separate from culture. Um, whereas, you know, the, 
I mean, artists engaged in the production of culture, I mean, the production, but also the analysis, the, the flow of culture, the, the, the criticism of culture, you know, the, um, the production of objects is really a sort of stepping stone towards that, the engagement with, with culture. Um, and, and one of the examples I, I use is um, Kazimir uh, Malevich's um, 1915 painting, uh, Black Square, you know, which is seen as the kind of foundation of European modernism. Um, and in 2015, so 100 years after the painting uh, was made, um, it was scanned and it was revealed that underneath the layer of black paint, um, uh, Malevich had, had written um, a Battle of Negroes in a, in a dark cave. And so this foundational moment of European modernism is a racist joke. Um, which is then covered over by literally a square of black, black paint. Um, and so the aesthetic object, you know, is, is the cultural object. Um, and haunted by um, its racist practices that are hidden within it. <laughs> um, and that's the work we should be engaged with. You know, I mean, that, I mean, that's what the work of, um, of production um, is engaged with, is this investigation of prior culture. I think we might have time for one more before we open it up for audience questions. And so I'm wondering in your views, to what extent is anti-racist pedagogy something that the work that happens in the classroom or is it more about a curricular or structural change or both is there a balance what what we're we looking at going forward what do we need is it curricular is it the work done in the classroom a little bit of both what's lacking perhaps i think it's all of it and money um you know i think it requires a a, a reevaluation of hiring and and um which is a practice that would go against the sort of neoliberalization of higher education and adjunctification that creates a, um, so many disparities and who stays in this pipeline, who does the work. Um, and But I think it's all over the place. If it's not structural and it's also not in the classroom, then you have, it's everybody just working for themselves. So some teachers do this work and they're flocked towards or avoided because of it. Other people are excused of doing the work which usually falls on the lines of um, not just racially white, but also patriarchy white men just love getting paid for doing nothing. Um, and at the same time, we also have, you cannot ask, because right now the big thing, like right here at Cornell, we're, we're trying to figure out how to have an anti-racist class um, that all students have to take. And they want all of the programs to set up all the work and do all the work. And then Pete, there's pushback where it's like, it's gonna affect my, you know, my, my freedom, my intellectual freedom to, to have to add this into my class, et cetera. Um, and the thing is, that's, that's, I mean, that's bullshit, but, um, but also what you, you show is that if you don't want somebody who has literally never seen a basketball shoot a basketball, because that's gonna be hilarious. So we also don't want a bunch of untrained people doing harm. <laughs> So it needs, that's why I say it needs to be, uh, people have to be incentivized, sadly, and then nobody's doing anything out of the good of their heart. And I certainly have stopped working out the good of mine. So I think you have to, you have to put money there, resources, um, and then you have to literally show people, show people. And then you have to have levels of consequences and accountability for those who, who will be willful. So one of the things I didn't add to my previous comments about things you can structurally do, and I was actually just reminded of it from seeing a, um, a tweet from Trusty McMillan Cotton a couple of weeks ago, or maybe a couple of days ago, I don't know what's time, but um, about stopping the, I just wanna be the devil's advocate for a second. That phrasing and that whole counter argument narrative is like the most racist work I see in a classroom. Because honestly, 
the devil has workers. He doesn't need you laboring. But it's also always, it's, it is a form of gaslighting and it's often used by men and by white men to create a disingenuous <laughs> space um, that is that makes things unreal. And so that becomes what happens on an institutional level. Let me just play the devil's advocate real quick and say, if we do this, then we won't have that kind of critical discourse. And as Narda pointed out, they act like it's subtractive when they know it's additive, when they know it makes it more abundant, it makes you more critical, makes you more sharper. They know if they were judged by the ways in which they judged us, they would fall short. And so it's just, it's all of those things. Um, so I just, I just point that out to say, it has to be everywhere, but it, it has to be, it has to be resourced. And that's why to see these programs continue after this year or another year to see these, um, these kinds of the kinds of hiring to see the kinds of money that have been put into teaching resources and see how that continues um, will be will be really interesting because people have jobs have lives have things happening we're dealing in a global pandemic. Um, so if it doesn't happen in that way you're just going to be like please add this thing you're going to hand somebody a basketball they're going to throw it and it's it's going to air ball and it's going to hit somebody in the stands, because if you don't do the work right you can actually be harmful. Like, that's the thing. You got people going around saying the N-word. I was just reading. And it's like, oh, no, 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 please stop. So, um, yeah, I'm going to mute myself again because, again, I can just kind of go on. I just, I really want to amplify what Samantha said in regards to the work has to be resourced. Um, otherwise, it's, uh, there's no work, honestly, um, without that. And I will... Uh, and that, uh, and it's, um, I mean, to, to answer your question, um, it's, it's all of the above. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, you know, again, I am, uh, I am lucky and I, I, I remember this when I am with other, with other colleagues from other institutions, the, at the beginning of this year, uh, and then going forward, uh, we were asked by our Dean to what would we need in order to um, have an anti-racist department, have an anti-racist curriculum um, and to, to name it and then to, to put money, to, to put a dollar sign towards it um, because he needed that information as he went to fight, you know, to go to the president and the provost um, to fight for this, and it was uh, it was one of the most amazing exercises to do to really think about in a department and really think about. So you're you're talking about faculty, you're talking about the people, you're talking about the uh, uh, the, the the buildings, the structures in terms of, of accessibility. You're talking about um, uh, the resources and the programming and the uh, the the sources uh, with which you're bringing into the classroom. Uh, and then you know, and money for that. Um, it 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 was it was unbelievable. And um, and again, being in a in a in a privileged space, uh, most of our needs were met and have been met. And um, because again, the I mean, we we know this. Um, anti racism is our budget. Like well, our budget will tell us whether or not we're being anti racist. Um, and and it's uh, it's clear that that if you if you support it uh, with resources, um, the work will slowly but surely become cultural. Uh, there will, uh, ideally there will come a time at the Yale School of Drama, you know, we introduced a new course, uh, similar to what Sam Samantha was talking about called uh, Towards Anti-Racist Theater Practice. Uh, brand new, this year, each department had to del deliver it in their own way. We could get as many resources as we could. A disaster in many ways and also amazing. And there will come a time at the Yale School of Drama where, where it was always there, just like you know, drama six, the history of theater. It, it, will, it will this this course will always be a part of, of of the school, even though for the next five years it's going to be messy, you know. Um, and and so I just I, I really think that um, you know, look at your budget, and that will tell you whether or not uh, you are a true anti racist uh, organization. I kind of want to riff on this um, extra part of this question that's embedded in, in Corey's question that has to do with hiring. 
just from my own experience um, at, at CSUN, when I came here 10 years ago, it was a predominantly white um, department, the faculty predominantly white, our students, um, Hispanic serving institution, 56% um, Hispanic, you know, like maybe 27% white, and then um, it's about 15% African American, and then our Asian American uh, population, Armenian population, so on. Um, I have put myself on every hiring committee. <laughs> and so like, if you wanna do anti-racist intervention, um, that's a really good place to do it. Um, in a recent hire, for instance, um, we were re replacing an older white gentleman who was in the area of persuasion and, um, and his work was in um, communication and law. And so I was calling my friends around the country like common law, you know, like, and my friends, my friends in, in um, like critical race rhetorics were like, that field is dead, you know, like you're not going to find anyone in that field. So we, we recrafted it as um, like um, social justice law and policy. And, um, and then because I was on the committee and I was chairing the committee, I was able to embed within the call that a requirement was intersectional approaches um, indigenous approaches, um, study anti-blackness, um, ethnic studies, you know, like, so I put all that in the call. And so um, when it came to, you know, like we of course got all those common law, communication and law people, and they were all like these, these, um, these white people, very, you know, very interesting, good people, but there were also like a handful of um, candidates of color who were looking at like um, the person we ultimately hired is looking at um, gentrification in Los Angeles and how law and policy is being used to dispossess Mexicans, uh, Latino populations of their land in order to, um, you know, create spaces for um, for uh, white hipsters and things like, you know, things like this that are happening in, in um, Los Feliz and the areas of, and all of our students, you know, who come from those areas, all of our Hispanic students are like, yes, you know, and, and so that was resonating with them. And so if, if we hadn't been, there were a couple of us on the committee who were, we, we, we would meet individually and we were subversively um, working under the under the cover to make it so that this would be the person that was hired. Our first, our, our first candidate was an indigenous woman and she ended up not being able to move to Los Angeles because it was too expensive. So Narda, when you're talking about the resources, like we were not able to give her enough because she has four children, you know, and she's a single mom. It's like, she can't live in LA with four children on $86,000 a year, you know? So, but that is to say, um, I think we can work even within like those structures that seem to be limiting, like finding out what little places that we have power and we can um, really literally like overturn, you know, this, this sort of mandate that we were going to hire this common law person, you know, and, um, and then we ended up hiring a um, you know, Latinx scholar. Um, and, and that's happened again and again in my 10 years of being here. And now we have a, a majority minority faculty, you know, in, and, and so now we're rebuilding the curriculum and the white, the white faculty who are now a minority, like they know we cannot vote them, <laughs> you know, like we, we, this is what we want to do. So we're building a decolonial curriculum and we're building an ethnic studies curriculum in communication studies. So, um, and that's taken 10 years, but over this 10 years, and um, um, I, I, I see so much change and so much possibility in, in a fair, fairly short amount of time. So that's just my experience. Yeah, I, I was just thinking about the, you know, the question of money, you know, the, you know um, Samantha and Nada, you've both talked about um, the, you know, how crucial it is that um, and often within the department, we, we we don't have a say over that. You know, we can direct redirect funds differently once we have it, um, but to bring it into the department, you know, often that the work has to happen elsewhere. Um, but uh, you know, also think of how some of that work of having to convince funders that we're actually doing the work of art and culture, whereas the perception is like, oh, now you're just doing the work of politics, you know, um, especially with racism ever mentioned. Um, and so there's, there's this whole other field of education we have that's now 
put onto us as academics um, to be able to bring in funding. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I'm also reminded of um, so, something else that um, uh, Sarah Ahmed talks about, that um, the kind of allowance that institutions um, that allow the sort of humanities, or especially the arts, to do this kind of work, to do anti-racist work, um, as a kind of showcase, which allows the rest of the institution to remain exactly as, as it is. Um, and so, you know, to, of course, we want to be doing this work, and we want to, we want to be, we want it to be a showcase, but we also don't want the university or the institution to be let off the hook um, in having to do this work across the board. Um, but, you know, otherwise in, in complete agreement with everything you've said. Um, at this point, we have a few more minutes for audience questions. So if you have one, um, please, you know, let us know in the chat. And I think we'll go ahead and lead off with one we've already received from the audience here about self-care for those of us doing this work. What strategies do you use to protect yourselves, your body, skill sets, talent, time, energy, et cetera, when hostility against this work shows up? I lean into humor <laughs> and um, I also, I take every leave. I, I also recognize the privilege of being at, at Cornell. I take every leave possible. So like I, like I teach for a year and then I'm like, I need to apply for something else um, because it is, it is very draining, um, especially in this moment that, I, that it feels like a reckoning and a lot of sentiments and histories and projections and emails. And I have also done the thing of to, to, to draw on um, Cotton's work again, to know your whites, which I, I think about what, what, what Narda has said. I will just like be like, here, white person A, this seems like a great job for you to talk to white, to, to white person B. Like if somebody, I literally was once in a whole E and I said, I'm so sorry. It seems like this doesn't have anything to do with me. <laughs> Let me CC this person. The strategic use of a CC and then stepping away and being like, I'm going to enjoy this time. I'm going to um, I have small children. You know, that's just, I, it's, that has, I will use them as I mean, I use them, I care for them, but I also was like, I can't, I'm so sorry. I, I gotta take care of these kids. Um, but mostly it has been about, about knowing who, who the allies were or knowing who wanted to be an ally and putting them to work, um, as well as, as taking very long breaks from the institution um, and, um, and community building. Um, within both institution and outside of it. It's very important to have a, a very group, a, a diverse group of friends, <laughs> uh, people who can remind you who you are when the institution is just like, oh, you're not excellent. And it's like, mm, I beg the differ. Um, you know, you just, you can have it. So, so having, having your people, um, having your time and really owning your, your privilege, um, like what it means to be a privileged space which is I'm gonna take everything that all of those white men took and more. Like I have designs and sites <laughs> on, on various things. So, but mostly just people and TV. So I'm a film and media scholar, like you, <laughs> another world um, and some really good programming. And sometimes it's not even what you think. I'm not gonna lie, Ted Lasso, white man, um, football coach, teaching football or AKA soccer in England, radically kind show, very, very good to the soul, recommend it. Only reason to get an Apple plus trial. Um, but yeah, so to, to, to find comfort in the comforts. I'll add that uh, saying no, I think is incredibly uh, restorative and something that I um, spin a, a significant amount of time in my life uh, feeling guilty for because uh, of often being the only one and feeling like, well, of course I had to do this thing um, because I'm the only, I'm gonna be the only black person on this or I'm gonna be the only 
Uh, and I've released all of that. Um, and I've also, so I would say, uh, so learning how to say no, and I have been very explicit with, um, you know, I, uh, just to, so just to sh give a sense, um, because of the times and because of, of trying to figure out how to come back into in-person production and uh, towards anti-racist theater practice and how do we reduce harm, I'm sitting now on four committees. Uh, I'm teaching five classes, it's ridiculous. And, um, and I've made it very clear uh, that this is not sustainable <clears throat> and that I can't do this. I, this is, this is, this is not um, okay. Uh, and I um, have, have a very great, a wonderful plan in place now going forward in terms of how to honestly, I'm gonna hire more faculty so I can reduce the class load. Um, uh, and I get really sort of, I get to really pick and choose in terms of my, my um, participation on these uh, various, committees and but it was really important to say um i understand that there are very few black folks in the department i understand that we're working on that but you can't put me on every committee <laughs> like just you, you gotta say it and again i have a, an immense amount of privilege because there's no there's no tenure at yale so so we're all sort of susceptible so nobody's so there's no um uh, i don't feel sort of threatened in that way in terms of not being able to speak up and um, I should say there's no tenure at the Yale School of Drama. And, um, and so, so I was able to say that and I was, I was heard in that with my, uh, with my dean. Um, and, you know, and again, and I, we, I certainly want to participate. Um, and we just made uh, uh, two new hires. So who can, who are now going to, uh, who are beautiful, amazing artists. Um, uh, who happen to be BIPOC folks. So uh, again, I think that I think that it's really important to say no, and I think it's really important to tell your chair or your dean or your division head um, that that's you know one one is fine, maybe two, um, and I understand that you want the representation, but I can't do all the representing. So that's how I have self cared for myself. Oh, one of my. Um... Thoughts, yeah, about TV. Um, yeah, there, there is some sort of amazing programming on now. Um, and I remember even, actually just a couple of days ago, um, uh, you know, watching, and it's both sides of the Atlantic. So, you know, some British programming um, as well, which, um, you know, we, we, we can more likely to see Black cast members, uh, black, black characters that are. Um, not performing blackness, like they're just part of the cast, you know. Um, and I remember thinking to myself, this was a couple of days ago, thinking, like, really, was that so hard? Like, you know, why, like, why wasn't this normal? <laughs> why hasn't this always been the case? Um, but um, yeah, Nada, I mean, I don't know how you're doing all that. Definitely just keep saying no. Um, well, we'll we are out of time, unfortunately. Um, but I want to thank you all again so very much for your participation on this panel and all of your wonderful comments and words of wisdom uh, and your time. You know, we all have so much time. It was great to be able to spend it with all of you. Um, and Mariana, do you have any other things to say as our last? panel this semester. Last panel this semester, I just wanted to thank all of you. Some of you are visiting back from last week or the beginning of the semester. Um, and everyone that has joined us, faculty, staff, students, and support uh, the series, we have learned together hand by hand um, all semester long. And I am um, I'm, I'm, I'm beyond words uh, thanking everyone and uh, learning with all of you together. Thank you for, for the, the panelists today. Thank you for your wisdom, your insights, your self-care tips. I will take those. And uh, we hope to continue to be in touch with all of you. Thank you for your time and expertise.
Thank you. It's been beautiful to be here together. Thank you to everybody. Bye now. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.